So very quickly, I love Christmas. Some of you know I've been here for a while. I love Christmas. I love the whole Christmas season. And so one of the things I like about Christmas is letters that kids write to Santa. And so here's just two of my favorites. Uh, one said this, Dear Santa, you did not bring me anything good last year. You did not bring me anything good the year before that. This is your last chance. Signed, Alfred. I love Alfred. I think he's cool. Now, here's my favorite one. Dear Santa, there are three little boys who live at our house. There is Jeffrey. He is two. There is David. He is four. And there is Norman. He is seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time. David is good some of the time. But Norman is good all of the time. Sincerely, Norman. I think that's how it works. I think that's how it works. So I, I, uh, I love the Christmas story, and I love uh, going through the pages of Scripture. And as I think about going through the pages of Scripture and reading the Christmas story, I want to commend that to you. And, and even as you think about, gosh, I'm on my journey, I'm, I'm to finals, I don't want to think about Christmas. But I just want to commend to you that there's something powerful about the Christmas story. My favorite word at Christmas is the word Emmanuel, God with us. It reminds me of his presence. Uh, my favorite part of the Christmas passage is the time it takes from the announcement uh, from Gabriel to Mary. And Mary says to this, and just imagine, uh, ladies especially, imagine being a young girl. We don't know how old, but let's say 14, 15, 16, having an angel appear to her and say to her that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her and overshadow her, and she was going to conceive a child and give birth and gave him the name to give to that child and that he would be the Savior of the world. Imagine getting all that message and know, and know from the moment of announcement to the moment of delivery would be nine months of increasing public shame and ridicule. Imagine knowing from the moment of that announcement to what would ultimately be the end of the precious child's life would go from what we now celebrate as the Christmas moment to the Easter moment, that eventually that precious child that you would give birth to as a young girl would end up growing up to be the man on the cross. My favorite part of the Christmas story is the in-between time, the announcement that Gabriel makes and Mary's unbelievable response. She says, be it unto me as you have said. And so what I want to just talk to you about just for a few minutes is just what it's like to be in the middle waiting for a miracle. Now, some of you are going like, I am so with you, Dr. J. I am waiting for my miracle, and it is next Tuesday at 10. <laughs> the miracle I need is next Tuesday at 10. I'm going to go through this weekend, and I have just really struggled in this class, and you know the class, and you know the professor's name. You know how they're totally unfair and how they're grading. You know, understand all that. And the miracle that you're waiting for is next Tuesday at 10 because you are going to pull it out, help me, Jesus, at Tuesday at 10. And if you do, you'll be able to pass the class. Can I... You can clap or say amen, either way. Okay, that's good. Some of you, uh, the, the miracle looks a little bit different. The miracle looks a little bit like this, like you're at the end of the semester and it was actually a bit ago where you ran out of food credits. Some of you know this pain. And you're going like, how do I get to the end of the semester? And I get wrecked by a number of things, but it really wrecks me when I hear about people who can't be at the place of eating food. And we live in a world where food and shelter and clothing and safety and security and all of that is, so, so maybe your miracle is waiting for that. Others of you, that, that there's another miracle that you're waiting for. It's, it's, it's the miracle of brokenness. It's the miracle of a relationship that's gone south. It's a miracle of a family that you've been grappling with. And some of you, just to be honest, don't raise your hands to this, you just got back from a Thanksgiving experience where it was not Norman Rockwell, if you know who that is. It, it was not uh, Disney Channel, if you know what that is. It was not Hallmark, if you know what that is. It, it, just, it just was anything but any of that stuff. You went to a family thing, and it was messy, and it was broken, and you're getting ready to go home again, somewhere around all that messiness. And you're just praying to God for the miracle. And if you're anything like me, maybe we're in the middle 
when the miracle hasn't come, you just wonder if it's ever going to come. You just wonder if brokenness is a forever reality. So I want to tell you about a story, and then I'm going to read you a Bible verse, and we're going to be done. The story I want to tell you happened to me uh, over 30 years ago. I think I've only told this story maybe twice publicly in my entire life. So I'm going to tell it to you quickly. I was praying about what do I share today, and I felt like this story was what God wanted me to share with you. So many years ago, I was in my early 20s. That's about 35 years ago, and I was in Southern California, and I was an associate pastor of a church. And uh, it wasn't in my normal scope of responsibilities, but um, there was a family in the church that began to struggle with some medical things, and I don't know why I was particularly drawn to them. I, I think we had just had a, a baby, and so again, it was about 35 years ago, and um, I was just struck by this family. The mom in this family was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer. And um, uh, she had three children. Uh, if I recall correctly, they were fairly young, let's say under 10. And uh, I had just, again, we had just, my wife and I had just had our first baby. And so I was like pretty sensitive to families with little children. And, and this mom who had three kids, let's say 10 and under, um, got diagnosed with cancer. And she went through a long, long fight. Um, and uh, she ended up moving from our community, which was in Ventura County, down to UCLA Medical Center. UCLA Medical Center is this huge, unbelievably capable, uh, efficient, technologically advanced uh, place where they, they do these amazing treatments, and they were trying some experimental treatments. And again, this wasn't in my normal scope of responsibilities, but I just thought, I need to go see her. And her name was Star. And so I just went down. I think I went down um, five or six times to visit her at UCLA Hospital. And uh, if you've never had this experience being with somebody in the hospital, it's just hard to be up. You know, you walk in the hospital room, and there's the person in the bed, and they've got wires in and out of them, and the machines beeping, and especially when it's something serious like cancer. And so we just, we just kind of went after it. And every time I'd go in there, I'd try to be upbeat and positive. I had driven an hour, an hour and 15 minutes to see her, and I'd, here I am. I'm here to bring hope and excitement and joy. And she was laying in the bed with cancer. And she had three precious children at home, and her husband was a wreck. And, but, you know, I just said, I'm, I'm going to bring hope to you. And by the way, this is not going to be a total downer, so, so hang in there. It, it goes up. But, but I'm, I'm just trying to be with her. And about the third visit in, we had kind of developed this closeness, and she just said, uh, Pastor John, I just, um, I, just um, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And, man, folks, i got to tell you, we were praying for the miracle. Like we were pressing into it. We were grabbing hold of heaven. And in my Baptist church, we didn't know all that that meant, but we were doing everything we knew to do to grab hold of heaven. And so I was in the room. She said, Pastor John, I just don't know if I'm going to make it. And her condition was kind of deteriorating. And, and so we talked about that on the third visit. The fourth visit, if, if I remember correctly, is when this particular thing happened. So I'm in the room, and I'm trying to be encouraging to her. She said, I don't think I'm going to make it. And by that time, all her hair has come out, and she's just really struggling, and um, she burped. And that was a moment of kind of lighthearted. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. And it was kind of funny. And I did something that I've never done before and I've never done since. And I probably will never do again. But in the midst of that, I said, can I tell you something about my story? And so I told a quick little story, and I, I won't belabor it, but I told her about when I was a little boy growing up. I was afraid of the dark. And I was afraid of the dark in a way that was kind of like scary the dark night of, in our room was just scary to me. And my grandparents, I wasn't really close to them. I lived on the East Coast. But I have a memory from my childhood. And my childhood memory was my grandmother coming into the room on one particular night when I was afraid. And she sang me a song. And after you just heard this amazingness, I'm going to sing it to you. My grandmother came into the room, sat by my bed, she said, Johnny, I know you're afraid, so I want to teach you a song. Why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus, let him be your stay. Don't be a doubting Thomas, rest always on his promise. Why worry, worry, worry when you can pray? She sang that song to me, and we prayed. Well, that's awful, but hey, we did it. Um, <laughs> So I sang that song in the room to my friend Star. And I said, Star, let's just agree together that you'll do your hardest never to burp when I'm in the room again. 
and I will never again sing in front of you. (laughs) That song that I learned when I was a little boy, I've been singing all my life. I've been singing that song all my life. And I taught it to my children, and I'm going to teach it to my grandchildren. And sometimes when I'm in the middle and the miracle is not there yet, I sing that song. Why worry when you can pray? And so here's what I want to say to you. The older I've gotten, the simpler life has become. Matthew 6.33 says this, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The older I get, the simpler life becomes. And so here's my message to you. I don't know what you're facing this week and next week. I don't know if finals are going to be the biggest mountain you climb. I don't know if you've got a relationship fracture you're grappling with. I don't know if there's a financial pressure that's causing you to feel unhinged. I don't know if what you're experiencing here or what you're getting ready to to go to there is the most challenging spot in your life. But one of the reasons I love these songs And one of the reasons I love the Christmas season is Emmanuel, God with us. And what I've learned is that no matter how high that mountain is that you have to climb, no matter how treacherous the waves are that you have to swim through, no matter how difficult the challenges are that come at you, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added into you. So what do you do when the miracle hasn't come? Here's what I do. Instead of running from God, I run to him. I run into the loving arms of Jesus. So I'm going to tell you the end of the story real quick. Star and I had one more visit in her hospital room. It was, I think, the fifth visit. In the fifth visit, she said, Pastor John, I'm really clear that my physical healing is not going to come. And I want you to do my service. But before you do my service, I want you to hear this very clearly. My husband and my three children are in the hands of the Lord. And I want you to know, Star said, that four nurses have prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because of my time in the hospital. I want you to know that my life will be a testimony. So 35 years later, I can't tell Star's story without crying. But I can tell her story and rejoice. There is a miracle. There's a miracle in the middle. There's a miracle at the beginning. And there's a miracle at the end. And the miracle has a name. His name is Jesus. And he loves you. And he longs to wrap his arms around you. And the fundamental message of Christmas is there is hope. There is life. There is joy. And it's found in the arms of Jesus. I pray that you seek him in the midst of the mountains that you have to climb, the messes you have to deal with, and in the midst of the middle where you haven't yet received your miracle. Would you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, you are in this place. Lord, I'm overwhelmed. I just think about the music these students are able to produce. I think about the unbelievable gifts that these musicians have. And I just thank you for their use of these gifts for your glory. And Lord, I thank you that Mary, as a young, young girl, said, be it unto me as you have said. She knew what lie ahead, shame and ridicule, a life of whispers behind the curtain, and then ultimately the death of the precious child who would grow up to be the man. God become flesh, God with us. So, Lord, only your Holy Spirit knows the specific circumstances of each person in this room. But you, oh God, you know. I pray that your presence, that your spirit, that your grace, and that your power might surround us with your goodness and with your love. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.